Welcome everyone to the South African Chamber of Commerce and to the event that we're holding today with two very, very well-known people. One of these individuals I have known for many, many years since I did my MBA. Looking at the title, um, Beyond, and I think of Beyond State Capture as by the title, I think of Beyond COVID. And that brings me to other thoughts around Beyond corruption, which is a lot of the other uh, challenges that South Africa is facing. So a triple whammy that is impacting the economy in every way. I'm Sharon Constanson. I'm chairman of the South African Chamber of Commerce. And um, the um, focus that we've got today as the chamber is to bring you some value added uh, commentary, some um, additional content so that you can understand some of the challenges that the economy in South Africa is facing. Uh, John knows these two individuals far better than I do, but I will introduce John in a moment. Um, what I would like to just mention to everyone is we are singing the anthem after this, um, half an hour after this ends. Anyone who wants to join us, we'll put that up in the chat line. Please bring your questions, uh, put them in the, in the um, Q&A session and I'll pick those up and we'll be ask, asking our guests those questions further on. The purpose of this, uh, the purpose of the Chamber is to support South Africans, to help South Africans in every way we can. We focus that through business and at the moment from a business perspective, we are looking to support uh, the Solidarity Fund to help uh, South Africans in need, both in healthcare and in otherwise pick that up later on in the anthem. If you could join us, that would be absolutely fantastic. We'll give you the link. John, you, none of you are here to listen to me. Um, I would like to just hand over to John Bassby, one of our board directors of the chamber, very well-renowned uh, journalist. I think he's well known to all of us. And I look forward to the conversation that John is going to share with all of you. All the best, John, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Sharon, and uh, a very warm welcome to our two guests, uh, to uh, Professor Nick Benadell and to uh, Mark Hayward. Um, I'm going to introduce them briefly because you will have, in your invitation, seen their, their, um, their full bios. Um, starting, um, starting with Nick, um, uh, Nick Benadell, uh, Professor Nick Benadell is a founding dean of the Gordon Institute of Business Science, more commonly known as Gibbs. Um, he was a uh, director of that school until he stepped down uh, a few years ago. And since then, he's probably been even more active than he was before um, in, uh, in, 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 in managing and, and in connecting um, people from government, labor, and business in various ways. Um, uh, more recently, he's been uh, involved in, in, in co-convening the, uh, the PPGI, the Public-Private um, Public Group Initiative, uh, which he'll be telling you about. And um, uh, that's all I'm going to say about Nick now. And I think I'll introduce Mark once Nick has finished. So, Nick, it's over to you. Is Nick hearing us? Nick appears to have fallen off. Um, John, I'll just look for him and see if I can. Uh, should I? No, should no. I? Should I introduce Mark and let Mark go first while we're looking for Nick? All right. Can. So I'll go ahead and uh, briefly introduce uh, Mark Hayward, um, who is a um, social justice activist, very well known in South Africa for operating mainly in the fields of uh, health and human rights. Um, and he has co-founded uh, two significant organizations, the Treatment Action uh, Committee and, uh, and the uh, Section 27, which played a very important role in uh, with accountability and uh, civil society in the uh, in the in the last uh, stages of the last presidency. Um, and uh, Mark is going to uh, talk to us from from his point of view, which is to do with um, uh, the interconnectedness between business. Well, he's going to deal with the civil society side, but the idea of having him and and Nick on this webinar is to join up the uh, what needs to be done by the business community and business relationship with government to create a growth economy and on the civil society side what needs to be done to ensure accountability and deal with the uh, problems of corruption which have caused us so much problem. So over to you Mark. 
Uh, thank you very much, John, uh, for that introduction and good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thanks for inviting me to say a few words today. I had hoped to follow Nick, obviously, and I was going to build my comments uh, partly in response to, to Nick, but uh, such is life. Uh, I'll do my best as the first speaker. The first thing I, I wanted to do this afternoon was to uh, take people back in time. Uh, I'm sure, John, if I ask you what did the date 15th of August 1985 uh, mean in South African politics, you as a historian and journalist would probably uh, have an answer to that, but I'm not going to ask you the answer. Uh, but it was the day uh, when P.W. Borta uh, was expected to give a reform speech uh, and instead gave a repression speech. Uh, it was the day when P.W. Borta failed to cross the Rubicon, uh, as we said at the time. And the result of failing to cross the Rubicon uh, in August 1985, as you and many of the people who will be on this uh, webinar will remember, was at least another five years of deepening economic crisis, of sanctions, of conflict, of repression, of death, that really uh, brought South Africa to the edge of disaster and in many respects brought the economy uh, to a point uh, that became almost uh, irreparable. Um, but for a combination of reasons, uh, we were able to pull back from, that, uh, from the cusp of that, that disaster. Uh, but what I wanted to say this afternoon is that I believe that in many respects, COVID-19 uh, uh, coming on top of the unfinished business of cleaning up state capture uh, presents us with a second Rubicon uh, moment uh, for this country. And I will argue that the consequences of uh, indecision or a wrong decision uh, will be vast. Now, as everybody here knows, uh, uh, in 2017, uh, South Africa and South Africans were able to work collectively, uh, business with civil society, with the trade unions, with the courts, with the churches. Uh, and I think as a result of an unprecedented social mobilization in the post-apartheid uh, period, we were able to push back against state capture uh, and make it possible or assist uh, bringing uh, the ANC to its senses and the victory of Cyril Ramaphosa in the ANC Congress uh, at the end of, end, end of that year. That was 2017. Uh, for good reason, we went into 2018 and 2019 with high hopes, a uh, president committed to clean government, but we also went into 2018, 2019, knowing the extent of the damage that was done, and that, uh, as we say here in South Africa, that none of the crooks were yet in uh, orange overalls. But I think what we didn't predict uh, in those years was what we have now, which is the game changer of COVID-19. Uh, of, of COVID and what I wanted to say this afternoon is that I believe that COVID-19 is bringing South Africa back to the brink. Um, I believe that it has exposed everything that is wrong. It has made uh, the inequalities in our society graphically visible. Uh, despite the best efforts of President Ramaphosa and some members of his cabinet, it's shown a state that is hollowed out, broken, uh, unable, for example, to use the period of the lockdown to prepare the health system properly. I heard this afternoon, for example, that in the Eastern Cape, the field hospitals will be ready in October uh, when in fact the surge is taking place now and the peak is expected in two weeks time. Uh, but it's also, and I think this is what marks us out differently from the UK and other places, is that in our country, there's very little fat left to make the burden easier. And from what I see where I work and sit in civil society and in social justice organizations, is that the lockdown has created enormous socioeconomic damage that business 
is going to have to get its head round, or all of society is going to have to get its head round if we are going to come out of this uh, as, as a capable society. Now, there isn't time this afternoon to go into that damage, but uh, I'm witness uh, through the work that I do to the hunger uh, that exists now, existed before, but it's got much worse. I think we're going to see how difficult it will be to restart our public education system, uh, and the failure to do that will deepen inequalities. Uh, we're seeing uh, substantial issues with, with, with food systems. And, and that's why my case to you this afternoon was to say that we are going to be up against a second Rubicon mo mo moment that is going to require bravery. And I think that it's a Rubicon moment uh, or, or, or period for business in particular. And in my last few minutes, I will explain why and what I think needs to be done about that. But I think you're faced or we're faced with a number of stark choices. Either we reform the economy and plan for the medium and longer term, or we will face state and economic failure. Either we build a meaningful social contract or we face social polarization and fragmentation. Either we take the constitution and particularly the rights parts of our constitution seriously and think about how the constitution and business can begin to serve the constitutional objectives, the, 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 the law, the praiseworthy objectives, or we are going to face breakdown and rule outside of the law in the future and, 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 and lawlessness. Now, I'm not, I don't believe that I'm exaggerating this. And what I particularly wanted to say to the South African Chamber of, 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 of Commerce was that this is also a moment of opportunity. That when P.W. Botha failed to cross the Rubicon in 1985, business played a very important role in pulling South Africa out of the morass and charting a path. It reached out, it built a bridge or bridges to the ANC, to the trade unions. And the case I, I would like to say is that business has to play that innovative pioneering role once again. Why? Firstly, because it's a matter of self-interest. But secondly, I think because business is one of the few sectors of our society where there is still social, where there is still cohesion and purpose and capability. Uh, and I think that we've seen that with the response to COVID-19, with the coming together under business for South Africa, with the innovation and so on and so on that ha has taken place. But this is where I come to my kind of specific niche or the role that I play in South African society because 35 years ago, business reached out to the ANC, business reached out to the trade unions. The question is, who does business reach out to today? To, to today? Uh, the ANC, in many respects, is broken. Uh, it has very noble leaders, a very noble president, but it's got many people who are deeply corrupt uh, and committed to a project other than accountability uh, 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 and good governance, which is the purpose of to topic, 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 topic of this. So I want to appeal to, to, to business to see a partner in civil society organizations in this country for trying to forge a serious contract around the economy, around the socioeconomic rights in our constitution from below a contract that can ripple and spread in society and that can encompass uh, uh, the capable parts of, of government. Why do I argue about civil society? I argue because civil society has breadth, it has depth, it has capability, it has location in communities, it has extensive ex academic expertise through its connection with universities, and it has cross-sectoral support. But I guess I'm saying if we don't start to make these moves, and if we don't start to make them in a way that is beyond rhetoric, for example, we, in, in this discussion, we talk about an economy based on equality, accountability, and sustainability, which are, are fine buzzwords, but what do they actually mean 
and what do they actually, actually require? And the last thing that I would say, and I'll conclude on this point, is that I think if we go down this road, then we have to also do one final change of mindset. And that is that instead of looking at South Africa's weaknesses continually and talking up South Africa's weaknesses continually, I think we have to talk to the very real strengths that continue to exist in our society and work out how it is that we can build upon those strengths. And I think that we still have unique strengths. We've seen time and time again, the importance of our judiciary, our constitution, unlike the constitutions of many other African East European countries is still intact, is still strong, is still a factor in accountability in many, many respects. We have a strong media, although I would say to you that the media is being badly broken by COVID-19. And if the media plays a critical role in accountability, we have to look at what the media will look like when we come out of this, this crisis. We have a strong business sector, as I've already said. And I'd finish by saying that although we think of ourselves as a country that has been robbed blind, and we have been robbed blind, we have substantial financial resources, we have substantial uh, 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 capital uh, uh, resources, we have a significant human resource base, and we have a, have a, have a, have a natural and proven resilience and, a, and a, a population that is still committed to the vision of Nelson Mandela and the vision of 1994 and our 1996 constitution. So, so I, I'm not uh, a pessimistic person. I see this crisis as an opportunity, but I think it's our last opportunity. And I think that we are going to have to uh, uh, do things uh, differently from the way we have been doing over the last few months if we're going to turn this crisis into possibility and if we are going to achieve the equality, uh, accountability and sustainability, which was the topic of this, uh, th this afternoon's discussion. Thank you very much, uh, John, I'll, I, I, and everyone, I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks very much, Mark, and uh, welcome back, Nick. Um, sorry we uh, missed you there in the beginning, but that's um, not a train crash. Um, I think I will put a couple of supplementary questions to Mark and then bring you in to tell the business story because Mark has presented a fairly serious challenge uh, to the business community as the key sector of society that needs to come to the, to the table. So Mark, if I could ask you, um, you know, the, the old adage is that at the end of the day, people only change when there is a real crisis. Um, now, we've had a fair dose of crisis in South Africa, first with the um, 10 years of state capture and the uh, hollowing out of the economy, and now with the um, unscheduled uh, COVID-19 and the lockdown and the economic hardship through there, we, we have a double crisis upon our hands. Um, from what you were saying, we haven't yet, re business and the society as a whole has not r really yet responded to that in a way that is going to affect deep change and to and to realize this opportunity what what needs to happen here is it is it purely an issue of leadership um uh, is it what needs to be done now to 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 get this to get this response going well i think we've responded to the short term humanitarian crisis and the immediate crisis of dealing with covid-19 as a health systems issue and i think remarkable things have been done and remarkable innovations in certain respects, John. But it's very clear now, and we know a lot more than we did at the start of COVID-19, that, that post-COVID-19 is not something we're going to see at the end of 2020. It's post-COVID-19 is going to be quite a number of years away. And although South Africa has, particularly in the first month or two months of the lockdown, almost achieved a remarkable reunification, uh, a, a kind of undeclared social contract. That social contract is beginning to fall apart again in the face of hunger, in the face of unemployment, in the face of the growing despair. Now, it hasn't led to a breakdown yet, but if it's not tended to, and if it goes on like that for months and months, and if, if poor people are once again left carrying the can, and if it's, if startup means a startup that is back to business as usual by business, then I predict social disruption and so on. Now, what I've seen, and, and I've noticed a couple of the people who are on this conversation 
and I, I, there's been a lot of too many webinars and conversations with, 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 with business and discussing this issue and that, but not that the ideas aren't good ideas, but they don't turn often into consistent working uh, uh, together. I've been party to probably three, four different discussions, the last on Sunday, where again, it was quite clear that say between civil society organizations and business, there's a lot of common purpose. But how do we build on that? How, how do we turn it into something rather than allow our society to become once more at, 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 at loggerheads again, which is what is going to, go, go, going to, go, going to happen? So I think we need con some concrete uh, proposals for reform to come out of this that require some give on all parts uh, if we're to cut, cut ourselves into a decent future. Thank you, Mark. Um... I think we'll cross over to, to Nick now because um, the questions really have been uh, directed at business community. Nick, um, you have been introduced. Would you like to do your opening remarks and then we'll continue the discussion but with both of you? Thanks very much, John. Apologies for having dropped off the call for a minute and uh, have it, having forced Mark to go before me because our idea is I would sort of paint a picture and he would follow up with his very insightful comments. Mark and I work together. I've got a great deal of respect for his insights. So, yes, I mean, I, I think, you know, we can layer this discussion at different levels. And I often think of South Africa now as a, as a big jigsaw puzzle, but someone's gone off with a box. We kind of lost the cohesion of how it fits together. And I think in removing uh, Zuma from the presidency, there was a sort of a realignment where business played quite an important role in the background. It didn't lead the process, but it played an important supportive role. And I think under COVID, it's done similar things, never as much as it could, and never remotely as much as is needed. Because essentially, our structural dynamics are incredibly difficult to solve. Let me just highlight one or two strategic weaknesses and then strengths, and then I'll talk about the kind of work I've been doing that relates to the comments that uh, Mark has been making. We have a very weak state. And you know, what I've noticed in this crisis, which has been reinforced, is you can have national policies like the example Mark gave of Eastern Cape hospitals, but they can't get it done through their own system. I've been working in, in Gauteng on emergency food. The provincial government is incompetent at doing what it needs to do what it had to do. And it was civil society that really stepped in and helped those most desperately in need. So we have to acknowledge that the state is not capable. It's large, it's expensive, and it's not capable. On the other hand, it's improving. And I do think that Sir Ramaphosa is bringing, in spite of the criticism, because we love to criticize, in spite of the criticisms, I think he's gradually uh, holding it together, a very difficult internal alliance, holding that balance together and, and doing what he can. So we start with a weak state. The private sector, as opposed to many years ago when I was engaged in these issues, is also quite fragmented. In the old days, Anglo-American would summon everybody and everybody would then be in attendance. And you, you, we gave birth to the Urban Foundation and various other institutions. It's far more fragmented now. Anglo-Americans not here in the same way anymore. Uh, we've got multinationals who argue their views. Uh, we've got South African based and South African linked companies. And then we've got the, the big mess of the SOEs and a very weak SME. So business is not that unified, although it's come together around these issues. And I think uh, the point that we would all be making is that we need the space and structure and systems to work out the social compact Mark is discussing, but to formalize it more and make some tough trade-offs. The problem in South Africa is, is business and government and civil society are able to move in isolation without confronting the, the thing that needs to be done. And the fundamental thing that needs to be done, I believe, is to keep working extremely hard on the social inequity. Whether we're talking about the the growing inequalities, the depth of poverty, the appalling unemployment statistics. We will never be safe or, or healthy if we don't bring this together. 
So we need some kind of newer compact, if that's possible. And I don't know if this crisis is deep enough to bring that about. And I think many, many leaders are working to do that. We all are. But whether it will come together or not, I don't know. Nedlack has a new leader. And Nedlack's been not very capable in the past, but maybe it, it, this will give it new impetus. Business for South Africa is working with civil society and with governments. So there's new impetus there. And I think the thing that often, you know, Mark was talking about, about self-interest. The thing that's so interesting about this country is that everybody calculates their sexual interest, but very few calculate the whole, the whole, the Commonwealth. And there's a folly in that because business needs a, a healthy society. It needs a, 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 a dynamic society. It needs a, a society that trusts and respects each other. And that's a long journey here. Secondly, government has very little real regard for what the private sector does, I believe. Although some elements in this administration might. Uh, historically, for many years now, business has been an alien body and government ministers don't really understand what it takes to manage and grow and innovate a business in this country. So, and civil society sort of went under the radar in the after the 90s. And that's been a great pity and, and, and so many people have contributed to rebuilding it. And I think that's been a, a vibrant sign that Mark and others uh, refer to and have played such a big role in. So it is about bringing all of that together and making the right calculation. I'll just share this thought. You know, in business, we measure profits. The question we don't really think about is what sustains long-term profitability? We like to be competitive. So it's our company, our sector. Actually, if you stand at bank in South Africa, the thing that sustains you for the long run is country. It's the country risk. And we don't have a metric to measure that. And that's where I think often folly creeps in. If government doesn't understand, it has to grow the economy. It has to create fresh investment that will provide a new tax base, which will allow the transformation project to continue, hopefully more efficiently than up to now. Uh, then there's a gross miscalculation. So my main point is it's pulling it all together. And Mark's right to stress, I mean, I, I deeply believe this, that South Africa is a, is a newish constitutional democracy. We are still awkward about our rights. We are awkward about our processes. If we just look at the slow rate of prosecutions, I go into courts and watch with wonderment. They creak slowly. We lose files. We just scheduled a, a terrible murder happened a few weeks ago, and the clerk wrote the wrong date on the court hearing. These kinds of maladministrations are really very, very, very problematic. Last point I want to make, I think it's the last point, is that uh, politically, the ANC has really strengthened its position paradoxically at its moment of weakness because it doesn't really have any opposition. And I unfortunately don't see the DA as being that opposition. And I'm not sure what the future of the EFF is. And so there's white space, there's open space about a political realignment. But the ANC has been able to mask and bury the corpses and not deal with its errors in a very open way. So those are just a few of the thoughts. I, th I think there is a element in the business community that I talk to where, where there is a lot new en of energy. And let me end by talking about the PPGI that you referred to. It's the Public Private Growth Initiative. And that was a few of us got together after President Ramaphosa was elected. And we said, let's do two Mamina work. And we let's work at sectoral level. We identified 23 sectors, many of who've never worked together before. 45 projects, 800 billion rand of domestic investment on condition we could remove obvious practical inhibitors. And we were just about to get to take off when COVID struck. And now BUSA, of course, claims that territory because it has a formal mandate. We were just a group of people who were meeting with the president, meeting with ministers, and putting forward at a very industry specific practical level what needed to be done. Look, I think all of us know South Africa well. It's been five minutes to midnight all my life. Uh, it's going to continue. That's our nature. We, we're a difficult but resilient country. Occasionally, we even win at the rugby. Nick, thank you very much. Um, and uh, yes, the point taken about five minutes to midnight. And thanks, thanks very much for those insights. Um, I come back to Mark, um, to Mark's three points, uh, which was if we don't reform the economy, um, if we don't build a new social contract, which you've, which you've dealt with, and if business doesn't come to the party in the sense of really being engaged in a partnership with government, 
Um, the consequences are very bleak, he spelt out. I mean, he was talking about failure of the state and loss of law and order. And uh, uh, that kind of crisis is something that's not easy to get out of. So far, we've managed to scrape through a number of crises, but that one um, will be somewhat final. Now, the, the, the two real problems that I see um, are, first of all, one of resources, and secondly, one of trust. Um, so the resources problem is that the state's been hollowed out, and as um, a previous speaker on a webinar, Benang Mohali, said, technically the, the government is, is, is bankrupt, if you, if, if, you, if you look at the whole SOE situation. So we've got that resource problem, which means either we've got to go outside to the IMF or whatever to get, uh, I'm not talking about now, but I'm talking about within the next three years, we're going to need those resources from somewhere. Um, and secondly, does does government is there mutual sufficient mutual trust between government and business for government to be able to say, look, you guys know how to do things, you can deliver stuff, um, which clearly we can't. Could we please have you uh, uh, helping us with that? Are, are we at that point yet? I don't think so. I don't think the brutal reality has got uh, got through to the system. If you look at how long we've taken over SAA, and it's a very complex set of issues, counterbalancing labor, political interests, national interests, and so on. I, I don't think we're quite at that government of national unity moment. But, we, but we're moving closer to that than the disaster that we faced 10 years, eight years, seven, five years ago. And that's a big, big plus for South Africa. Democracy has worked through either through the electoral process or through public opinion. And remember, we've removed two presidents without a gunshot. So I think there is that we get heading in the right direction way too slowly. And that's the challenge is that there's a too much lethargy in all in business and in everywhere. There's just not the sense of crisp urgency. I think there's a thing to add to your list, John, and that's capability. It's having a capable government and a capable business community. I've lived through the end of mining, more or less. And now we're in the knowledge economy, 60% of our GDP is services. If you look at the public education system, you'll put your hair out because the prospects of us being able to manage that other than elites uh, is really, really worrying. So yeah. building, Thanks. you know, government doesn't train civil servants at all in any yeah. substantial way. Well, you can't run a modern economy with the transformation job yeah. we need to do. But right. that seems to me to be the dilemma, Nick, is that the private sector has capability and the government doesn't. So when can you actually, when can we bring those two together? Uh, Mark, do you want to uh, have a co uh, comment at all on the issue of resources and, and trust and capability? I mean, just to say that I, that, that I agree with all three, but I think that, that until you capability. deal with the trust question, you'll never be able to address the resources and capability questions because trust is necessary to get working together in a sustainable way. But I also think, and I, you know, I'm not an economist, so I am nervous about making suggestions about economy or resources, but I do think that we have to be prepared to think out of the box about resources. I do think that we have to be prepared to take risks and we have to be able to think long-term. I was saying to Nick earlier on today, there's a price to not investing. Not, not investing, holding back resources doesn't save money. It just defers and sometimes increases costs. So now we're in, we've been in the middle of this crisis with ESCOM, uh, as everybody here knows. But our water infrastructure is disastrous. In Port Elizabeth today, the dam is down to 7% that feeds Port, Port Elizabeth. The price of deferring fixing the, 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 the water infrastructure in this country is to allow it to collapse to a point where it gets beyond re repair. Now, I know these are incredibly difficult questions to confront, and I'm not speaking here saying, okay, well, business must ride in because Mark naively thinks that, that business has the bucks to be able to do this. But, but we have to find solutions. Otherwise, you know, I agree with Nick on everything, except that I think perhaps we're about three minutes to midnight uh, now, because I do think that, that there's a point at which states fail. 
um, and I think that I spend, I know Nick spends a lot of time, but I, I spend a lot of, lot of time in communities. Uh, you know, yesterday I was in, in a place, just Kensington, Bertrams, Judith's Park, just on the edge of Johannesburg city center, going from house to house with a bunch of volunteers. There are people starving, you know, not two kilometers away from the Johannesburg city stadium. It's untenable for this type of situation to continue. It will break at some point. Thank you, Mark. Um, Nick, uh, can the resources that we have, let's not worry about other resources that we need, can the resources that we have be used more efficiently and can business play a role in that um, starting now? Uh, uh, absolutely. We must lose 30% of what we spend due to inefficiency before we get to corruption. And this is why building capacity in the state. We've got a huge state. State labor costs have shot up through the roof in the last 10 years without any gain in productivity. We've got too many in the cabinet. We shrunk it a little bit, hasn't been shrunk again. We've got this another layer now called districts, which are meant to be a coordinating entity. We just create jobs in the state. And what we've done in the state and enterprises borders on the criminal, because these are public interest institutions, or at least they should be. And we're in, we're in mining. The government is in diamond mining. Uh, no one will ever explain that with any logic. So those need to be trimmed down. And uh, yes, we, we do have resources. Mark is right. And I think South Africa is strong enough to attract outside resources. And I want to hark back in a way or go back in a way to this organization because I think that the members of it and the business community in the UK can play a strategic role in building capacity, in engaging and being constructive and investing because in a country that has, has, has had so much innate capacity, you know, as much as we talk about all problems, there's nothing like Santon on this continent. Santon is unique and the companies that are there and the stock exchange, the banks, the law firms, and yes, they're elitist, but they're unique. Malawi has nothing, nor does Zambia, nor does the DRC, Lord help us all, even remotely close to the capacity that's here. So we've got the resources and we've got the skills. Business needs to contribute more, but it, it won't spend its money on building public infrastructure. Maybe it will start doing more public-private uh, joint projects and the master plans that have been being put together now by sector are joint plans done by business and government. Let me say this, I didn't say it clearly enough. The doors are open in government. We couldn't get meetings with ministers three, five years ago. Now we can get meetings with ministers, with directors general. We can get more than one minister in the room at a time. Uh, there's been a major change in the attitude, but it's not linked to delivery yet. And on a good Thanks, on a good day on a good day I think it's going to improve, but these things feel sometimes overwhelming, and we need all the help you know all the involvement we can get, because this is still an exciting country. We've had long historical links. Uh, they've got lots of investments, lots of two-way engagement, and I think it's a very strategic partnership. Thanks very much, Nick, and thank you very much, Mark, both for your time and for your insights. It's deeply appreciated to have people of your um, knowledge and, and caliber talking to us. I see Sharon has reappeared on the screen, so it's probably time uh, to hand over to Sharon to put some of the questions that have been coming in. And I think she will also tell you perhaps some of the things that we are doing um, as a chamber, but clearly there's more that we can do. So I'm glad that you raised that. And, you know, we, um, people in the diaspora, I think increasingly, um, share the, the, the concern about what's happening in South Africa and want to do something. And I think between us, we need to forge practical ways of them doing that. Over to you, Sharon. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen, Mark and Nick, in the order of um, arrival on our stage. Thank you very, very much for what I would say is more honesty than I've seen in a while, more transparency of some of the issues that we're dealing with. Um, and one of you talked about the words brutal re reality. It is unbelievably frightening when we hear what is in the way of the solution, the five minutes uh, to midnight now becoming three minutes to midnight, people talking about us getting to the precipice 
but not going over the edge of the precipice yet. Um, you were talking about uh, reaching a point of government of national unity and needing a crisis bigger than we have to get there. Is that time or is that something else going wrong between now and that moment? And how far away could that moment be? John, I, I didn't mean government of national unity in the formal sense. Mm -hmm. Correct. I, I don't Thanks think for clarifying really, to others. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I don't think that's very likely at all. Mm -hmm. But a, a, a relationship about national unity mm -hmm. with a common conviction of, a, of an agenda, that is possible. Yes. And, and some of the items were the ones I was referring to. Let me give you an example. Now we are submitting, as we speak, to the minister, a minister, proposals on worker engagement and worker inclusion in big companies, providing bigger stakes and bigger involvement. It's those kinds of steps that are about a relationship of national unity. Mm -hmm. You can't just have a few elites running these companies without sharing the benefits and sharing the insights and so on. So we need change in almost every aspect. But it's more about the relationship. I will say one thing about this. There's a younger generation that I see at Gibbs, for example, that are not hung up the same way as their predecessors, and that are far more open, they're more cosmopolitan, they're more global, they've had the benefits of, of two decades of good education, and they're going to provide a new generation of leadership. And I'm, I'm pretty confident that if, if, we, if we who can make a difference can create an environment where they can do what they can do, this will start. South Africa is a modern society in many ways. Mm. And it's not a revolutionary society. That's one of its myths. It's a conservative society. If that generation is able with the technical skills to get into SME, to get into corporates, uh, to change things, I, I think we'll see a lot of good action. Mm -hmm. Mark, do you want to comment on that before I put forward the next question? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with, with Nick. I mean, South Africa, I'm constantly amazed by the innovation, the ideas, uh, the things that are happening out there that you discover by accident uh, that are not necessarily in the public knowledge. And it, and it keeps my confidence in our ability to, to do it as this as this country but certain systems are broken and and one of the systems that is broken is the systems for proper cross sector consultation if you like i mean nick mentioned uh nedlac uh which was set up as a as a space for labor business civil society and government to to forge common agendas on on things but NEDLAC was set up 25 years ago. The workforce looks very, very different. It's much smaller now. The trade unions have fragmented. The civil society people who sit there don't have actually very little contact with civil society. So some of these spaces that should be places for consolidating collaboration and vision are, are broken. And, and so as a result, we, we talk at cross purposes. And, and so, so you get good initiatives. You know, Nick mentions this thing. Nick can sit with Ibrahim Patel and hatch some great ideas or with Praveen Gordon or whatever. And they're great ideas and they're great initiatives. But there has to be something underneath them if they're going to be sustainable, if there's going to be belief in them, if they're going to be more than false starts. And I'm not saying that they will be false starts, but, but, but we need some sort of convergence that I think is lacking at the moment. And because there's not a convergence around a, a, a meaningful center, what we get, what we hear is the loud and dangerous polarizing voices on the edges, which will get louder and more polarizing if we don't fix these fundamental flaws in our society as they exist at the moment. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the insights. A specific question, this one from Jacka Marie. Please elaborate on what you believe the fundamental things are that business should be doing in South Africa beyond growing the economy and creating employment. And he states as an added one, I'm not talking about ESG, CSI or sustainability in the traditional sense. So I, I would argue that one of the dangers we face, and I'm sure Jack is very aware of this is you know, I, I talked about mining a bit earlier. Our industrial economy has been very badly damaged by China. 
Uh, our service economy has certain very good sectors, including banks. Uh, companies need to build the capability of their workforce. And I, I've always believed this, and I don't mind being criticized for it. I think that we need a far more inclusive style of management in our organizations. And to really invest, as banks, for example, have, in building internally the capacity of companies to compete. Government also, sorry, business also, I, I think can do far more with government and can engage more and pressure and criticize where it needs to. And the channels are open privately and informally and formally. One of the things that Mark was referring to, that's so frustrating is we've got all the institutions. We've got the institutional arrangements. Lisa Seftel has been appointed to run Nedlack. Nedlack, Edward Kieswet is now running SARS. We've replaced a lot of the bad guys with much better people, but we need to build the depth so that the systems function. And many of our systems are sclerotic. It reminds me of living in the UK in the 70s. Uh, it was sclerotic. It just, it just needed a fresh dynamism in its institutions. But the institutions are there. We are a constitutional democracy. People do have legal rights. We have a judicial process. We have a free press. So business needs to be part of the Commonwealth. Identify itself first. I'll never forget meeting the Prime Minister, the second Prime Minister of Singapore, Lee, uh, um, not Lee, uh, Go Chok Tong. And he said to me, I said, what's the purpose of business in Singapore? He said, it's to support society. I said, what do you mean? He says, their job is to create wealth for society. The government's job is create, to create an environment where they can create wealth. And if they step out of line of that too much, we bring them back into order. They're not a standalone free agent. And I think one of the things we suffer from in South Africa is the Atlantic model of capitalism. Mm -hmm. We've got this idea that shareholders can drift off, you know, and make returns. I don't have any problem with that. But you can't have a dysfunctional society while you have that. And that's where the Commonwealth, where the joint calculation comes in. Um, a slightly more specific question, but within a similar space to um, either of you to speak with. Maybe, Mark, you can give us your first insights. You made reference to the competent president that South Africa has got. He's a very competent businessman in his own right. But yet, you and you have a very competent business community, however much you're saying it is quite... Um, broken up at the moment and not as uh, cohesive as it should be. And I loved your analogy of pieces of puzzle without a box. And, uh, I did see a mess. Um, how can he, how can government, how can we, how can business empower the state president? Sure. I'm not sure if I have an answer. <laughs> <So that's fine. laughs> uh, um, look, I think it. It is it's complicated. I mean, he's vulnerable. Uh, as Nick said, he's brought about important improvements and reforms and been hit, unfortunately, by a crisis at the wrong time, which has helped in some ways, but hindered in many other respects. But I think it's finding solutions to some of these problems of resources, of capability uh, that we've already already talked about. And it, and it takes us back to you know, Jaco's, Jaco Marie's, Jaco Marie's question, which is that, you know, you say, let's not talk about what we're doing about CSI, but business puts a lot of money into CSI, but doesn't get bang for the buck. Uh, if you look at the amount that goes into education, the amount that goes into health, I think it's, I don't know what the last figures, but it's like 5 billion rand a year, health 5 billion rand a year, education. Why is it not getting results? in terms of system changes. What are system ad adjustments that, 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 that would, would lead to, lead, lead to improvements? I, I think business needs to listen more to some of the ideas that it considers uh, too left of, of, of center, uh, uh, at least countenance some of the ideas. I mean, I was on a call uh, Jacko was, in fact, on it on, on, on Sunday uh, with a bunch of uh, senior business people and some civil society economists. And it was funny, there was quite a lot of common ground uh, between us. Um, but one of the points that was made by one of the economists was, well, there has to be fiscal consolidation. 
yes, there has to be fiscal consolidation, but where must fiscal consolidation take place in a way that can get the results without hurting those who are hurting the most already, and perhaps in a way that can generate some, some growth in, uh, as well. So I think there's got to be quite a big rethink about some of the ways that business has been doing business and society has been doing society over the last 20 years. And actually, believe it or not, for the reasons both Nick and I are giving, you'll probably see results because we're still a society with a lot of energy and a lot of enthusiasm that can be mobilized when it's given good ideas and reason to believe in those ideas. Sharon, Sharon could I come in for a second? Uh, yes, sorry, sure. Nick, you, Nick, Nick, you go ahead. I was just going to say there are two specific areas where I think business needs to engage harder with the president and in a supportive way, but harder. The one is state reform that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. We have to restructure the state for a modern society. Yes. But the area that I'm most heated about is state-owned enterprises. There are 700 of them. I don't know how many are technically bankrupt, uh, whether they're local, provincial, or national. And business can really push hard to get this dealt with. What it's been, it was under the National Party, a way of absorbing poor Afrikaners into urban and modern urban life and modern, the modern economy. And they've been used for the same purpose, reasonably naturally, because it wasn't easy to get into the private sector. So people went to the state and the state owned enterprises. But we really have now created a, a terrible, terrible disaster on our hands. And Eskom's the well-known one, but almost everyone I've looked at, and I've looked at quite a few of them, is technically in great, great difficulty. There are four kinds of them. They're the ones that we need in the public interest to be run efficiently, and we give them monopoly rights, and we should govern them exceptionally well because we give them a monopoly. If you compare SA Breeze to Eskom, they were both monopolies. I need say no more. Then there's some ones that are very big that actually the private sector could partner with and clean it up and make it much more efficient. Then there's a whole category that they shouldn't actually be in. We should close them down. We should sell them off. We should get out of the business and let the economy flow. And then, believe it or not, there's some we should start because all the research in Asia and in Silicon Valley, believe it or not, shows that the state is the critical platform builder for entrepreneurship. But I wouldn't go to that fourth pot for a while. I say reform and clean up this portfolio. And I think business got all the capacity. You now, people like Jacko have made such a contribution since he stepped down from the front of the battlefield. And there are many, many like him who are willing to do that. And we should push to could keep doing and playing that kind of role. John, yeah, thank, thanks very something? Nick. Uh, thanks very much, Nick. I just wanted to come in with a thought here. I'm what I'm grappling with is how do you bring these two together? That issue of trust. Um, uh, government is there to provide the framework for the for the private sector to to succeed, but the private sector also, as you said, with your Singapore example, is there to is, is there to benefit society. Um, do we perhaps need? A leader from the business community. Let's stop putting all the all, all the pressure on government. Do we need a leader from the business community who's not co-opted, as as you say, Yako and Trevor Manuel and all the rest have played wonderful roles, and we've now got this whole new SOE advisory body, and there's a plethora of advisory people. But don't we need one leader from the business community who is close enough to government to have that trust, but has the real interests of business and the society at at heart? Uh, I think to it, actually lead this thing. I think a lot of that is happening behind the scenes. I think it's there. And as I said earlier, I, because I've followed this for so many years, is there was a sort of a hierarchy uh, in, in, the, in the old days of how business worked. And that sort of also moved away a little bit. There's not a single business leader that I think can say, this is the statesman of our business community or woman. And uh, maybe it's a group of people and all these advisory groups, that's who's in them. And I'm seeing people volunteer, you know, th this group that I've just been working with now, all well-known people, all volunteered, given two weeks to come up with ideas, put them forward to the minister, we'll see where they go. There's a lot of that going on in this country. Just very and rewarding the, to hear. It's, and not, it's not an individual. I think in a way we have to move away from heroic individuals as much as we can. It's a system and a structure and a process. And just to finish this, the president 
You know, I don't think we reflect how lucky we are to have this president. If, you know, in simplest terms, we have a man who was a unionist, man who was a politician, he ran the ANC as Secretary General, he was in business, he's been there. I mean, you can't ask for a better preparation. Mm -hmm. And I've got huge regard for him. I know he's not the, you know, a lot of people say he's a compromiser and negotiator. I think this thing's a powder keg that needs a lot of delicate tiptoeing. And he represents that. I wish it could go faster. Mm -hmm. Every morning I wake up and say, let's go faster. But he's got a shrewd understanding of the map of power relations. Remember, he's got to deal with the alliance. He's got to deal with the ANC leadership. He's got to deal with his cabinet. He's got to deal with the NEC. That's before he gets to civil society and business. So it's a very tough road to hoe. And I, I have a, uh, we just very, very, the alternative, as P.W. Werther used to say, <laughs> is too ghastly to contemplate. <laughs> Just a last question. Um, many of us say sort of fairly lightheartedly, but with genuine meaning, is we would not want to be in the shoes of the decision makers globally in government at the moment to decide what is right for a country. And South Africa is no different to any of the other countries where you're having to make decisions versus the economy, the people, people's health and living versus dying. And then our government in South Africa has got to deal with the internal political factions uh, that they have to deal with. So two questions out of that is, has South Africa managed to flatten the curve with some of the early hard decisions they've been taking? Is the one aspect which I think is of interest to us, and bearing in mind we're going to have to be fairly snappy with the answers. Um, and the other aspect is, um, at what point do we feel that we are going to win this battle of deciding whether it's the economy or is it the people or is it the people's health and welfare in terms of being able to feed them? How do they make those decisions when you've got political factions pulling in opposite directions? Mark, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Those, those are, are big questions for 30 second answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe you'd better set up another d discussion. Always best Look, to leave on a high. So we shall do that in a moment after you've been given the floor okay, for a well, few Well, I don't want to leave on a low. Um, I have to say that the hard lockdown bought time that wasn't well used. Our, the the COVID-19 epidemic is exploding uh, now in South Africa in a horrible way. We now on 10,000 new cases a day. Uh, that, and that's in the face of a poor uh, testing uh, system. We are going to get hit uh, badly. Uh, here in Gauteng, where Nick and I are, uh, you know, we are just at the bottom of the surge. The surge is here. Uh, and it's going to cause a lot of pain. And it's going to cause a lot of, 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 of disruption over the next few, few months. You know. For, for me, the question is that it's, it's, it's not economy or people or health. It's how do we do all three at, at, at the same time? And, and, and so again, it's, it, it, it's how we frame these questions. I do believe that it is possible to serve people and serve the economy and serve health. And we've run out of time. But one of the things that Nick said which I'd love to unpack, and this is where we need the ideas that Jacko and people talk about, is the critical thing we have to coalface, we have to work on is inequality now. Well, that's easy to say. What does it mean in practice, in the way we do business, in the way we relate to government, in the way we relate to other sectors of society? Somebody here, Martin Borta, talked about education. Basic education is absolutely critical. You can't tell me that there isn't a fix. Uh, within the system to the basic education crisis, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm sorry, big questions, short answers, but I'll stop there. We have had a lot of questions come in in the last few moments. Uh, we're not going to be able to get all, to all of them, and I apologize to those that uh, have placed questions literally um, in the last few moments. We've had them come in literally the last five minutes. Um, apologies, I'm not going to be able to post all of those. Um, Nick, do you want just a last sentence um, before we close? Yeah, you know, I, um, thank you firstly for inviting me. And I just want to reiterate the vitality of this particular relationship. I think the UK has a very important role to play for the reasons I mentioned earlier. 
But, you know, in some ways, I, all the after years of watching plans and NDPs and you know, uh, Ned Lacks and all these institutions do their thing. I think the, the South African mentality is to put your head down and get on with what you're going to do tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And let's get practical and let's realize we need each other. South Africans have not quite realized we need each other here. We need the differences that we all bring. If I look at the humanity of, of people in this continent, I look at the skill in the business community, I look at the, the idealism of, of some of our politicians, we need each other. And so it's a miscalculation not to know that you actually all depend on, you're all in the same canoe. So if things sink, we all go down. I only have to look north of the Limpopo. It's a magnificent country that on paper could be a great success. You see, you can bugger up a country. You don't have to go on a big program to learn to do it. The big program <laughs> is fixing a very difficult situation. Thank you very much. And thank you, John, for um emceeing a wonderful conversation that we've had with these two gentlemen. Mark, thank you very much. Nick, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, just as a quick closing comment, uh, the Chamber is doing what it can, being a Chamber of Business and Chamber of Commerce. We are using those routes as a Chamber to support the ground roots activity that the Solidarity Fund has developed out of a business operation rather than looking at many, many opportunities that one could look at funding. Everyone obviously has their choices of what they want to do. But through the South African Chamber, you can donate very simply even five pounds. If that's all you want to do, you know it will go to the right cause. So I will put up some links if people want to stay on a second or two uh, to give you the links. And in half an hour's time, we are all getting together to sing the national anthem as a community, which is always a fun thing we do every couple of weeks, uh, just to join the Coronzoids and the PJ Powers of this world who we will be singing with just to have a little bit of light relief in what is a very, very challenging time. And please, those of you who want to make a difference, either through effort or financially, please make contact with the Chamber. We are there to see what we can do in the way. And one of the questions was, what can we here in the UK do? I think Nick's been sharing that and we can act as a conduit for you. So thanks very much to all our people. That was an absolutely wonderful hour's conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Everyone.